Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we'll take you to a jaw-dropping discovery in Southeast Turkey that will have you stepping lightly. We'll speak to an expert from the gaming industry about the latest trends and why for developers, thinking outside the box is key. And we'll also sit down with groundbreaking British dancer and choreographer Akram Khan for a glimpse inside his creative process. But first... As the Sarajevo Film Festival notches into top gear, Showcase sits down with Adnan Haskovic, one of Bosnia's most famous screen stars. Bringing Keith Haring into focus, the late great artist and activist gets his first ever UK show 30 years after his death. Even if you don't know or recognize the name Keith Haring, chances are you've seen some of his signature works. His graffiti prints and bold line drawings are featured on everything, from t-shirts to baby buggies. Haring died in 1990 of AIDS-related complications at the age of just 31. And now, almost 30 years later, a major retrospective of his work is taking place in the UK for the very first time. Showcase's Miranda Atti went to check it out. The Tate Liverpool is holding the first ever Keith Haring exhibition in Britain. It's a comprehensive, in-depth look at a man who was as known for his activism as his art. And according to co-curator Tamar Hems, three decades may have passed, but his work is as pertinent as ever. Haring's really very relevant at the moment. Um, he was an activist himself. His work is quite political, which people will be able to see in this exhibition. And um, we live in quite a turbulent time now. So, um, you know, all the discussions that are going, around, uh, going on around the environment, around race, um, you know, these are things that Haring was also concerned with. And you see that coming out in a lot of his work. So I think um, that relevance was very important for us. Herring was a central figure in New York in the 1980s. He created subway paintings and huge murals because he wanted his work to be accessible to as many people as possible. The Tate's show highlights how quickly he worked, emphasizing the sheer number of pieces he produced in his lifetime. One of the things that Keith uh, has done is to explode the sense of an artist, a professional artist working in a gallery context, um, explain to the world how a commercial uh, mass market presence could be part of an artistic process. So I think he has influenced many artists and you see this in the work of street artists who sell t-shirts and so on. I mean, like, there are many that could be named and who will name Keith when saying, what influenced you? How did you get into doing this? He created a pop shop in 1986 in Soho, New York, full of affordable art for the general public, followed by another in Japan a year later. In this room, the Tate Liverpool has recreated the kind of clubs Keith and friends would have visited in New York in the 80s, complete with speakers, black light, and of course, his paintings. It's a nice touch, the music, the decor. In fact, the entire effect has been recreated to be just as it was when he was alive. But alongside his fun, colorful, joyful works, he also created graphic art with a message. He spoke out against racism, sexism and poverty. But nowhere was he more active than in raising awareness of the AIDS crisis, which devastated the artistic community in the 80s. Keith contracted HIV AIDS at a time when a diagnosis was a death sentence. He knew he didn't have long, Julia Gruen tells me. He was so in touch with his times and, you know, he was very, very socially conscious. 
And so today the foundation, which has now been operating since 1989, and he asked me to run it, you know, we've given away an awful lot of money and the causes to which he determined we give are to AIDS and HIV, awareness, research, etc., to, you know, help disenfranchised youth, which today often means children or teens caught up in the judicial system. In many ways, this Keith Haring exhibition is way overdue, but it's also immensely touching, encapsulating the life of an artist who lived for his public and who believed art should be free for everyone. It also highlights the sheer power of art. From his posters to his murals, he was constantly spreading a message of awareness and tolerance. Something that, in these divided times, we would do well to remember. Keith Haring at the Tate Liverpool will be on show until November the 10th. Miranda Atty, TRT World, Liverpool. Showcase continues its coverage from the 25th edition of the Sarajevo Film Festival. Today, we bring you a one-on-one -on -one interview with Adnan Haskovic. He's one of the most sought-after actors in Bosnia and one of the few to make it to Hollywood. Showcase's Ali Jan Pamir had the chance to sit down with the Balkan star to find out about how his journey has landed him in Tinseltown. What was the Bosnian film industry like when you first started in the business? I have to be honest, it is a tragical fact, but but Bosnian film industry was better than, back then than than uh, than today Be because you know we are a small country we are we are post war transition country and uh, this is first time from from I don't know hundred years that we are how can I say independent and you know as a young nation. Uh, in that point, in this, in this time and period of history, uh, I think that post-war time, uh, especially until like 2005, uh, Bosnian cinema was uh, more focused, more concentrated. Uh, government and, and, P and, and politicians uh, had more, uh, how can I say, sense for, for culture, sense for, for movies. How does the Sarajevo Film Festival contribute to the local film industry? This is silver lining of, of, of Bosnia, Sarajevo and Bosnian culture. Because especially if, if we consider uh, how, how uh, Miro and uh, crew back then during the war, how, they, how, how the idea about a festival created, in which occasions during the siege, during the aggression on, on Bosnia, and, and that idea was uh, that our art is about, that, that about human spirit, about human triumph, about struggling to survive, about uh, how, to, how to make the world a better place. And you work with one of my favorite directors of all time, John Hu Bong, on the movie Snowpiercer. What was that experience like? First of all, first when I met the Bong, I, I did a self-tape for, for, for the role and I didn't know much about the project, about him, about... I didn't know that he is the director of the project. Uh, and I, and I, I watched uh, one of his movies before, but I didn't at that time, you know, put the pieces together. And when I did the self-tape and I got the role, my agent called me and, and uh, 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 he said, this is Joe bon Hong, new movie, and, and you will work with him. And, and, and then I started, th then I was, you know, like in a stomach, I, I feel excitement. I was really excited to meet him. And uh, first of all, he's a great human being. He's, kind, he's, he's you know, that person's like a like grown-up child, you know? As a Bosnian actor, what are some of the challenges that you face on an international production? I, I, I really, it's unbelievable fact, but when you are working internationally, like especially in a Hollywood productions, uh, 
nobody nobody is considering you as a Bosnian actor, you know? You are you are an artist equal to, to all the artists there and uh, they want you because of your talent, because of your you are professional. You were also involved in the high profile American drama legends. How do you compare working in film to television? Directors when you are acting, uh, when you are performing with your, with your uh, co-actor in a scene, in a dialogue, if you have a big poses, which usually and normally you have in life, and it's truthful, director will say to you, guys, please, I know it's beautiful for me. If we are shooting a cinema or a movie, th this would be fantastic. But this is a TV format. So please compress compress your performance better better if you do it here then otherwise they will do it in everything so compress your acting compress your poses i know i know this is better but you have to do it on on faster you have to do it differently so it was challenge for for all of us because you know you have to act on, on some different way. In the moment, you have to find another solutions. What advice would you give to young actors who want to capture an international audience the way you did? It's maybe a rude word, but you are like, uh, you know, you are, you are factory for yourself. You are, you are also, uh, uh, how can I say, um, creation of that factory, and you have to sell yourself. When I'm when I'm when I'm talking about selling yourself is, you have to uh, investigate every day what is going on in worldwide, what is going on in this in this particular moment, uh, what they are searching for, what what type of actor you are, how you will fit in that new wave in cinematography or new wave in television. Adnan Haskovic, thank you so much for this interview. Really was my pleasure and, and thank to you. <laughs>
at London Sadler's Wells Theatre, rehearsals are underway for Khan's latest project, Outwitting the Devil. A Babylonian tale exploring life, death, memory and ritual. His choreography draws heavily on his training in the classical Indian dance Kathak, which he combines with a range of contemporary experimental forms. Born in 1974, Khan began his solo performances in the 1990s. Since then, he's won dozens of awards, including an MBE, or Member of the Order of the British Empire, in 2005. A career highlight was choreographing part of the opening ceremony for the 2012 Olympic Games in London. Much of Khan's creativity is inspired by his childhood experiences. His solo production, Desh, is a meditation on his Bangladeshi heritage and his struggle with forging an identity as a British Asian. It won him an Olivier Award. In fact, he's a Bangladeshi who came to England with a family, had to kind of negotiate an alien culture and find a way to create a kind of a positive connection. And I think that struggle creates a kind of resilience and, and the capacity to communicate in a much more inventive and innovative way. Khan has collaborated with a wide range of artists from flamenco dancer Israel Galvan, actress Juliette Binoche and musician Nitin Swarney who wrote part of the score to Khan's production in the mind of Igor. Can you hear me? In his final solo production, Zenos, Khan reenacts an Indian soldier reliving the horror of the trenches during the First World War. His take on the experience of many unnamed Indian troops who answered the call of the British Empire. Khan has stopped producing solo pieces, citing injuries and the desire to spend more time with his family. But through his choreography and group performances, he plans to continue to re-describe the world in his own unique way. The world of gaming is many things. It's where cutting-edge technology, storytelling, visual art and play come together. But it's also a massive industry, with nearly 2 billion active players on the planet. To mark that, the city of Cologne in Germany is hosting Gamescom, Europe's biggest gaming event which sees developers show off their latest creations and thousands of eager fans ready to play. Europe's biggest gaming event is drawing huge crowds once again to Cologne, bringing fans, esports stars, developers and industry analysts under one roof. Gamescom is whetting the appetite of gaming enthusiasts, responsible for the growth of an industry that now generates greater global revenues than TV. We are the ones um, developing very fast and are very dynamic and innovative. And that's also when it comes to new business models. We are always ahead of things and, and pushing forward. Be sure to stay tuned for more coverage here at Gamescom. This year's event focuses on cloud-based gaming amid a trend towards abandoning traditional consoles such as the PlayStation or Xbox. But not everyone agrees that they're going away. People are always going to want that experience of chilling on the couch, playing video games. And until Stadia and xCloud really crack that cloud infrastructure with zero delay, games like shooters will, and players that are really into shooters are always going to want that flawless experience. One of the highlights this year is the return of famed video game auteur Hideo Kojima after five years. Kojima showcased his much-anticipated work Death Stranding, which features Mexican filmmaker Guillermo del Toro and actor Mass Mikkelsen. You'll be able to go wherever you want. The event is also featuring more than a thousand exhibitors, which include not only industry giants like Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo, but also a growing number of independent game creators with their latest offerings. Let's turn to game developer Onat Hekimoğlu now to talk about the latest trends in video games. Hi Onat, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. So, PCs yeah, once dominated the video gaming industry, but now it's all changed and it's all about mobile gaming. 
does it con does it continue to grow? Uh, yes, I definitely think so. Um, you know, the mobile gaming actually it introduced a completely new audience to gaming itself. Um, you, everyone nowadays has a mobile platform, a cell phone, or so where you can play games with. Um, and you know, if you have a big audience, of course, you, you produce a lot of content for this audience. And I think this this will also go on because it reached uh, or it brought people in an audience and gamers in who were not playing games before. I mean, Pokemon Go was a good example of this, and it was also a good example of something else, augmented reality. Would you call it another up and coming trend? Um, well, I think it depends. Even with Pokemon Go, for example, I, I've seen a lot of people play it and I also played it, but I often just turned off the augmented reality function. So as I see it right now, it's a novelty thing. So it's interesting to try it out. People want to try things that are new, but in the end, you know, it depends on how it helps to deliver the experience you want to achieve with a certain game. In terms of Pokemon Go, it wasn't necessary to get the feel, even if it seemed like a nice idea at first. So time will show if uh, it's, a, it's a practical thing for gaming. I mean, AR itself, I think, will be a... Um, Big trend. Now, we've also seen more in the releases go mainstream than ever, and they are actually competing head to head with big, huge productions. Do you think they will continue shaking up the industry in the games? Yes, I, I definitely think so. And of course, I hope so, as we are an indie <laughs> developer by ourselves. Um, the main thing is that, you know, the big, big publishers and developers who are spending now 150, 200 million on a game of course, want to go the safe route. So not many fresh new ideas are coming. If you spend so much money, you want to make sure that you sell a certain amount of that game. Um, and people or the gamers, the audience gets tired of having the same thing in several iterations every year. Um, so people are looking further, seeing you know what, what other things are there. And especially in the, in the um, area, where people have the courage and you know the, the possibilities to work on unique things, really, really nice things happen. And in the end, it's you know the, the good games that attract the player. It's not about if it's indie or big budget. And now everyone has access to the tools, even the big budget productions use. So the boundaries basically are yeah kind of dissolving and even the big players start to um, get inspired by the indie kind of, you know, developing, for example. Speaking of which, you're actually the director of an indie game called Harold Halibut, a handmade adventure game. Tell us about it. Exactly. Yes, uh, so the game is in development for almost seven years now, finally coming out next year. It's um, an adventure game and we are actually building sets and puppets in the real world um, we are using a real world workshop, like in a stop motion film, you can imagine. We are building characters and sets, 3D scanning everything to bring it into the game. So basically everything you see in the game is handmade and that this is probably why it takes so long. It's going to be an exciting story about friendship mainly set in a distant world on a water planet. Game developer Onat Hekimoğlu, good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you too. Have a good day. Let's end today's show by stepping into the wondrous world of mosaics. Countless civilizations left their mark on Turkey, so it's no surprise the country is often referred to as a huge open-air museum. In the southernmost city of Hatay, nine years of meticulous archaeological work has unearthed a 6th century mosaic unlike any other. Remember, you can find more of our stories on Showcase's YouTube channel. I'm Elif Bereketli, see you next time.